everyone and thank you for joining us on emphasis q3 fi 18 results conference call we have with us today mr nitin rakesh ceo and mr surya narayanan cfo before we begin i would like to state that some of the statements in today's discussion may be forward looking in nature and may involve certain risks and uncertainties a detailed statement in this regard is available in the q3 fi 18 results uh, announcement release that has been sent out to you earlier and now invite mr nitin rakesh to begin the proceedings of this call thank you chef good afternoon everyone and thanks for joining the call let me begin by wishing you all a prosperous healthy and a successful 2018 i hope all of you have had the opportunity to go through our mdna which provides the details of our operational and financial performance for the quarter ended 31st december 2017 over the past few quarters we've seen a clearer focus from enterprise clients on expanding the adoption of new gen technology areas whether to leverage them for operating efficiencies in areas such as application of automation, optimization of run functions, elimination of manual processes, etc., or more importantly, in adoption of new tech to integrate into digital channels to consumers, thereby impacting customer service, experience, as well as gaining a deeper understanding of customer needs and thereby having the ability to target customized products and services. Both these trends have con continued to create opportunities for service providers who have invested in positioning themselves with the right set of capabilities. With the knowledge that every business is a digital business, we are proactively providing a roadmap to enable our enterprise clients to reimagine their digital future. The emphasis X to C square and front to back transformation approach are solid foundations aimed at delivering high impact business outcomes of speed, innovation, and cost effectiveness. We have, in the previous calls, discussed how we see our business moving from a period of stability in 2017 to growth in 2018. While this is an ongoing process, we are happy to share that we have made good progress so far this year and our performance is reflecting this. Direct Core, which has been our engine of growth, continues to grow above industry. We have added growth engines through our enhanced service offerings as mentioned above, as well as addition of Blackstone portfolio of companies. The share of new gen services revenue in Direct Core has increased to 41.2% in Q3 FI18, reflecting a 39% YOY growth over the corresponding period of last year. In the DXC business, while the MSA gave us much needed stability last year, in FI18, we doubled our sales efforts and strengthened our, part our partnership with DXC, which is now helping us to win large transformative projects, which can be seen in our growth so far this year. We continue to partner with DXC to grow this further along with the various vectors and channels within DXC that we, we have spoken about earlier. Digital risk business is now stable in the band we had discussed earlier, and we are working on strengthening the pipeline that would bring growth here going forward. I will now move to the Q3-18 financial performance. Our direct international business continues to track well and has reported another quarter of strong deal closures at US $130 million, higher by 34% YOY. This takes our tally of YTD FI18 deals to $435 million compared to $276 million in, in YTD FI17, higher by 58% YOY. Around 83% of the deal wins this quarter and this year are in the focus areas of digital, next-gen, and GRC services. This provides good revenue vis visibility going forward as well. Moving on to the Q3 FI18 financial performance, consolidated revenue grew 3.5% QOQ on a reported basis and 3.7% in constant currency terms. The growth was broad-based across direct and DXC business despite the impact of seasonality and client-specific year-end events. Direct International grew 3.6% QOQ in reported terms and 3.7% in constant currency. Direct Core, which contributed 78% of direct international revenue in Q3 FI18, grew 3.4% QOQ on a reported basis and 3.5% in constant currency terms. Direct Core revenue grew 9.5% YOY and 13.8% in constant currency. The deal wins in this business are a reflection of the strong pipeline is broad-based and spread across new clients, strategic accounts, as well as the Blackstone portfolio. We are confident of sustaining our above industry growth in direct code this year. DXC HP channel revenue saw another quarter of robust growth of 3.1% QOQ in reported terms and 3.6% on a constant currency basis. DXC HP revenue grew 15.8% YOY in reported terms and 20.5% YOY in constant currency. We have restructured the business across many vectors and are also at the front end of a number of deals. The outlook on the business remains positive after several years of decline, and we are seeing above market growth in this channel in FI18. As we had communicated earlier, digital risk business has entered a stable phase 
with revenue maintained in the range of 28 to 30 million dollars per quarter. We started seeing some margin uptick in this business as well, and we continue to bring operational efficiencies as we speak. Moving on to the margins, despite the headwinds of annual wage hike and plant specific year end events, the operating margins improved 110 basis points QOQ to 15.5%, driven by revenue growth and improving operating levers. Our fixed price contracts have moved from 21% of revenues in Q317 to 25% in Q318. During the quarter, we had a favorable one time settlement that contributed 40 bips to the margins. We continue to focus on accelerating our revenue growth. With the ramp up of large deals, we are confident of operating in the stated margin band of 14 to 16% EBIT. Our cash generation continues to be strong. Total cash on the balance sheet stood at Rs 23,153 million, which translates to 359 million US dollars. Net cash from operations during the quarter was at Rs 2,068 million. To conclude, we are pleased with our efforts leading to strong TCV wins, broad based growth across all our business segments, and strong margin growth. We are focused on driving volunteer gains in our strategic accounts. We've also created a set of strong reference clients and are building solutions in areas where we believe our customers still have to invest. Our second engine of growth is within the Blackstone portfolio, and we have a systematic approach in place to tap the opportunity. The third is taking a programmatic approach to position ourselves as a, as a continued value-added partner with HP and DXC, helping them win in the market for transformation deals. We've also been expanding our overall sales footprint and in, to enable continued focus on sales pipeline. To that effect, we also recently appointed Guru Grewal as head of Europe, and we'll continue to focus on that region as well to leverage growth opportunities. On that note, I thank you once again for your interest, and I will now request the moderator to open up the line for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin with a question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchtone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset mode while asking your question. We would also request participants to limit your question to two at a time. Thank you. The first question is from the line of Nitin Padmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question and wish you a very happy new year. Um, uh, Nitin, just wanted your thoughts in terms of uh, what do you see in terms of the runway in terms of uh, the Blackstone portfolio? Uh, this year has been quite decent in terms of closures there. Uh, what do you see? How do you see the runway there? And the second is how is the focus on non Blackstone uh, or direct clients? Sure, Nitin. Um, I think the I think we've talked about the fact that uh, there are about 80 companies in that portfolio, roughly 1.6, 1.8 to 1.8 billion dollars of addressable IT spend that we can tap into. And uh, we started with, uh, you know, we, in the first quarter that we actually had wins, we announced four deals. And ever since, we've obviously been building on on that success uh, continuously. So while from a deal win perspective, there's definitely a contribution coming from that portfolio. I think revenue contributions is just starting to kind of show up in the in the revenue line. So obviously there is, a, you know, from a percentage of revenue perspective, there is definitely room for growth as we ramp up the deals that we sold into and, and continue to also see further organic growth in those relationships. Uh, so that's one data point that, uh, you know, you should think about. Uh, second data point is this is not a static pool, and there are companies that are uh, enter and exit this pool pretty regularly, even though that entry and exit is fairly lumpy and is based on market opportunity for them as well. So we we now have a fairly well uh, articulated uh, you know service catalog for that portfolio. We are starting to not only look at going into deals once they are in the portfolio, but also engaging with early engagement as those uh, you know those companies are evaluated for uh, you know, investment or disinvestment. So so I think there's a uh, there's, there's continue, we continue to win deals, and we'll, we continue to feel there is a, a lot further upside for us to, to tap into. So that's on the on the portfolio side within the the PE channel. On the direct client base, uh, I think we fa we are fairly pleased because the TCV uptick that we are seeing also includes uh, you know hunting and new logo sales. Uh, to ramp up that effort, we are further investing in Europe, as I mentioned. And my expectation is that uh, we'll have to continue to, to grow uh, across all the four categories that we talked about, which is existing strategic clients, 
uh, you know, new logo acquisition, uh, Europe, which I expect should grow uh, above company growth uh, next year, as well as uh, you know the Blackstone portfolio. Sure, great. Thanks, Satan, and all the best. We'll come Thanks. for a follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Apurva Prasad from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question and uh, congrats for a strong quarter. Um, my first question is on uh, the DXC business. I mean, uh, that's seen a phenomenal acceleration. I mean, so, so from a slightly medium term point of view, uh, you talked about industry leading growth earlier. But how do you really see this, you know, from slightly medium to long term point of view? And, and within that, you know, follow up to that, uh, uh, which are the verticals or service lines, you know, that are driving growth? Uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, as well as for your question. I think uh, if the focus question is on the DXC HP relationship, let's take a step back and revisit what we talked about back in May. We basically restructured that uh, relationship and we called out four distinct uh, strategic partnerships that we are building uh, between DXC, HP Enterprises, HP Inc., and Microfocus. So while the early successes have uh, you know come from our efforts with DXC, especially at, at the back of the cloud partnership that we announced, uh, an application transformation relationship that we announced in, in May. I think there is, uh, uh, you know, from a wallet share gain perspective, there is definitely room for, for continued growth, uh, especially as we start tapping into, into the other three relationships, you know, HPE, HPI, and Microfocus. So I think we, we feel very uh, good about the fact that we've taken the opportunity and we've started to show a lot of value. And we think there is a runway for us to continue to find growth, uh, especially as we look at these four large strategic Fortune 500 company, you know, as our as our relationships. On what is really uh, driving the growth in terms of service lines, uh, I think bulk of the growth is categorized into two areas. Uh, firstly, there is a lot of service transformation work. So there is, uh, you know, think of it as core services that we are applying transformation to. I shared the example of. Uh, uh, predictive, uh, you know, applying analytics to to uh, infra services. You know, we have a very you know strong award-winning platform called InfraGenie, so that's driving some growth. We also have the ability to take on uh, uh, and, and you know um, other services and apply things like virtual agent, uh, AI machine learning, voice integrated, you know, assisted uh, um, support. So a lot of those vectors are are clearly playing out, and, and you're seeing that in some of the numbers in the MDN as well. The second vector of growth, and that's the reason why that partnership on cloud and application transformation was very important, is much more front-end uh, transformative deal related, where we're actually working jointly on uh, on going to a certain select segments of the market that have been very clearly identified in actually helping uh, and, and growing uh, the pie of wallet of share in new gen services. So I think those are the two broad categories of where the service line growth is coming from. Great, great. Thanks, and uh, all the best, Nathan. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, the question on the city mortgage uh, thing, uh, if you could share uh, more input from that front. And secondly, uh, from the uh, Europe strategy perspective, given you are uh, uh, expecting it to be a new area from an incremental growth perspective. Uh, what we were doing earlier where we were present only in few countries, uh, maybe Nordics and Belgium and maybe one or more. So are we trying to spread out far more deeper within the Europe that uh, that is the reason uh, we may see growth from there or is it from the same geography which we were focusing earlier? Uh, great, I think uh, let me uh, take the city relationship first. Um, Again, it was an existing relationship. We have now uh, used our, our what we are calling the T-shaped strategy of understanding depth of the mortgage domain. Again, we used uh, digital risk as our as our mortgage expert, uh, you know, subsidiary, and applied the uh, you know this path-breaking front-to-back transformation method that we talk about, where you put customer in the middle and you actually try to impact customer experience. And, uh, and and reduce uh, you know operational overheads as you tar do targeted products and services. Uh, so I think that's kind of the the way we've stitched this deal together. It's a perfect example of how we are bringing our expertise across the company uh, to bear and becoming a digital transformation partner for the mortgage business at City. 
Now, this is a, uh, obviously a long-term relationship, and uh, you know what we announced is is a good example of how we are starting to apply transformation. We expect uh, that uh, you know this will be a, a multi-phase, long-term engagement. And on your on Europe, uh, the second question. So on Europe, uh, I think uh, we we see about uh, just about under 10 percent of our revenue coming from Europe at this point in time. Broadly, we were concentrated in uh, in the UK geography. Um, we feel we have enough of a reference client base in that geography now to apply the same uh, playbook that is working for us in direct core in North America. And the playbook really is, uh, you know, we have some marquee local clients that uh, we want to make sure that we, we put executive bandwidth, uh, coverage, focus, and relationship, as well as take our service catalog of, uh, you know, digital transformation through f 2 b service transformation platform, uh, as well as the whole cloud and cognitive capability to expand our wallet share with these strategic customers. So we have identified a set of clients that we that we think we should be playing the wallet share game, game just like we've been doing in the U.S. Second uh, area of growth is uh, we also have identified, uh, you know, a very very focused set of uh, hunting accounts. Uh, we are starting with UK um, and uh, France because we have a very strong footprint in France with our wide subsidiary. Uh, and in fact, we've been in that market for 20 years, and on 7th of uh, December 2017, we. Uh, we actually had a 20-year anniversary event where we re relaunched Emphasis in France using that, that footprint that we have with, with our white customers. And uh, the third vector will be as we penetrate deeper into these two markets uh, in our chosen areas with our chosen service lines, we'll then evaluate you know, how do we spread into areas like uh, uh, DAC, which is Germany and Switzerland, as well as uh, Benelux and, and Nordics uh, in that order. Okay, and uh, lastly on this pricing that we have seen in this quarter, uh, a pretty sharp jump uh, across uh, matrix. Uh, how much of this are related to uh, typical Q3 related uh, adjustment of lower number of working days and what could be the status because of the mix change or maybe uh, in general gain if you would have uh, got in any accounts? I think uh, the impact from Q3 seasonality is I would say fairly low. Bulk of the gains really coming from mixed change, uh, driving next gen services, and applying levers, uh, you know, that are helping us uh, get m much better realization from our plan contracts. Especially on the on-site ITO service, where the jump was significant, is it because of something like platform uh, revenue? Absolutely. So we are talking. You know, we talked about applying service transformation. In fact, on the same call two quarters ago, there were some concerns about the type of business and the type of revenues we are selling. And I think I explained uh, the concept of service transformation. So, uh, you, you know, you're reading it right. We're actually looking at how do we apply automation uh, platform. I talked about InfraGenie as a good example of that, uh, as, as well as things like virtual agents. And, and that's clearly creating a, a level of uh, efficiency that we are starting to see reflect in our, uh, our price and our margins. Perfect. That's it from my side. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gaurav Frateria from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, congratulations. Good quarter. A uh, couple of questions. Firstly, on the DXC, you explained uh, the various vectors of growth. It will be really helpful if you can get some color with respect to how big is the order book or some quantification of, uh, you know, the growth in pipeline versus last year. That will be really helpful. Great, Gaurav. Uh, I think uh, right now, uh, you know, we haven't historically been breaking out our pipeline uh, win, uh, win, deal wins or pipeline in DXC HP channel primarily because it used to be a fairly lumpy uh, back-end uh, delivery extension type business. Uh, as we start to, you know, get a little better, uh, you know, alignment on strategic deals and, and signing new TCV wins, we'll, we'll definitely start sharing that metric. But for now, I think... Uh, it's fair to fair to say that uh, we'll continue to give you uh, guidance on on the growth trajectory, uh, you know, with, with market as a benchmark, and uh, and as we as we get a little more comfortable with the data and and have the ability to uh, you know to curate it in a way that it can be presented, we'll present that to you. Sure. On the, secondly, uh, if you could explain, the, is is the contribution of uh, revenues from Blackstone portfolio quite minimal, and do you think this will become uh, significant? Uh, or at least more meaningful uh, going into FI19? Yeah, I think right now, as I said, uh, most of the year's really gone into uh, winning the deals and executing and getting them to, to convert to, you know, through transition. So right now it's fair to assume that our overall contribution 
is very uh, very minimal. Uh, I would really say the lower end of uh, single digits. Uh, but as we one we ramp up these deals and two we expand our footprint with with some new deals, we'll we'll hopefully start to see uh, you know this this play out into uh, a, a much more healthier number. Now keep in mind, you know the only benchmark I think we talked about. Uh, maybe three quarters ago was uh, you know the comparable portfolio company uh, that that is in the BPO services that that has been operating in that channel for a long time. Uh, now in, in you know obviously at a much smaller scale their their revenue contribution from from the portfolio is uh, is very high which is almost 20 plus percent. So you know while we are not uh, guiding to a certain number or any number, uh, we do have uh, you know certain. Uh, Aspirations, and we think we should be able to to continue to operate in that channel as I as I operated early, uh, indicated earlier. Sure. Last question from me on the DSO. What really happening that the DSO has been moving up uh, con consistently for last few quarters? Is it to do with the uh, construct of the deals in the current environment, uh, or something else? And uh, secondly, on the digital risk, uh, if you can quantify where are the margins, and is there any further for, for that to grow? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think on DSO, there is uh, this is not linked to any deal structuring. It's a plain and simple execution uh, seasonality issue. I think this was a difficult quarter with a number of days at, at the end of the month, end of the quarter being unavailable. So we expect it to come back to our mid 60s range, uh, hopefully by Q4. Um, and as I'm saying this, I'm I'm uh, you know also uh, uh, appreciative of the fact that. Uh, you know there has to be uh, a lot more. Uh, actually, in fact, anything there should be a lot more more execution rigor to, to to get to that number. So I think we don't see this as a as a trend. Uh, it's just more like a blip. On digital risk, uh, the we talked about uh, margins trending to high single digits last quarter. Uh, we are uh, now very happy to say that we've entered into double digits. Is there any further headroom to grow? Um, what margin or uh, revenue? Margin. In digital risk, uh, I think we see it as uh, you know if we can actually continue to convert the pipeline and find growth, then definitely there is more headroom for margin to grow. Um, so I think in a way they're they're both linked because the the best lever for margin expansion is uh, revenue growth. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Bhandari from Aquary. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi Nitin. Congrats on good execution. Uh, you know, I have two questions. So the new deals for you now are these net new deals or they also involve a element of uh, renewals? These are net new deals. There are no renewal included in this. All right. And what would be the average tenure? I'm not asking for deal specific tenure, but average tenure of these new deals? Two. Uh, they are uh, around two to three years uh, tenure. Okay. Second, you know, given that you know our revenue momentum has picked up sharply and. Some of the strategic initiatives have also started yielding results in terms of hunting new clients or, you know, mining the Blackstone thing. Do we think, uh, you know, uh, we could grow faster than the industry at overall level going into FY19, possibly into double digits? I think uh, we'll talk about FY19 as we get closer to it. We are still focused on uh, executing Q4. Uh, but aspirationally, and I think we said this at the beginning of FY18 as well, uh, we have, we set ourselves the goal that our direct core business should continue to grow above market, and we took on a uh, at that time a fairly challenging uh, you know ask of growing HPDXC at least at uh, if not above market. So we're very pleased that both of these businesses are actually growing uh, highly above market uh, you know for the first three quarters, and we expect that uh, for the for the full year FI18 uh, we'll probably end up uh, you know in in the above market growth for the full company. Aspirationally, we want to continue to have above market growth for the company uh, as we you know as we enter the next uh, you know two to three years as well, and, uh, and that's the focus and, and, and charter that we have as a team. Sure, that's helpful. My last question is on you know beat uh, uh, taxation uh, clause which has come in the U.S. Uh, you know tax reform. Does it in any way impact our you know operations in U.S.? So, uh, as you know, the beat taxation, which was announced uh, the last week of December by the president, uh, the uh, the tax is just not the only the tax rate which is changing, but there are a lot of other related sub regulations which are part of that. We are still uh, studying that uh, provisions, and uh, we'll come back and update uh, if there is any specific impact to our margins uh, due to that change. Okay, thank you and thank you. have a very good year. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankit Pandey from Quan Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question and a very happy new year. 
my question would be uh, around the uh, around our six uh, logo wins uh, that we've had this quarter. Uh, any specific uh, uh, trends or successes that we'd like to highlight, Nathan? Uh, Sankit, we probably won't take uh, client names, but I think it's fair to say that uh, it is ref very reflective of the two large trends I talked about. Uh, firstly, our message on customer-centric uh, transformation that in you know that leverages cloud and cognitive capabilities is, is resonating very well. So we are very happy with the, you know with using that as an entry entry uh, you know strategy and and uh, aligning with their business outcomes. Secondly, uh, I think the uh, the investments and the focus that we continue to put in uh, um, uh, our new logo acquisition um, across both U.S. and uh, and Europe is also uh, you know con will continue to to play out. So, so I think these are uh, uh, these are good incremental progress steps, and and uh, we we believe we have to continue to to find more wins to 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 future proof the the growth, especially in the direct core business. In relation to what you just mentioned on on the sales team, uh, we had mentioned a couple of quarter ago, uh, quarter ago that we you know sort of finished our uh, or on the way to reorganizing the sales team. I wonder if you could you know uh, just flesh out that uh, a little bit uh, at this point. Sure. So I think there were three things that we did uh, as we uh, talked about uh, our our uh, uh, what we call the repurposing or the. Uh, realignment of the of the not just the sales team but effectively our capability generation engine as well. So we centralized a lot of the capability generation into uh, you know into central units. Next Labs being the primary focus where we we put a lot more focus on cloud cognitive and service transformation. Uh, second thing is we also took an approach of uh, breaking down a number of the silos that we had created you know that we had uh, between our multiple units and. Uh, to continue to find uh, revenue synergy opportunities because client logos were fairly valuable across multiple units. So the example that I gave you of the city, uh, you know, mortgage digital transformation win is a good example of how we are now applying those capabilities that were generated centrally uh, into every unit that we actually have clients with. Same thing with the wide emphasis cooperation in France. We expect that to uh, also play a role as we as we focus on Europe over FI19. So I think it's, it wasn't just a, a repurposing, it was also a, a slightly different approach of centralizing a lot of the capability units and then looking at synergies across multiple units. Uh, and I think one good example that I gave a couple of quarters ago was uh, the, the DXC partnership on cloud uh, and application transformation was effectively taken, uh, the capability that we had built in a direct core unit and applied that to our DXC relationship. So I think we are constantly looking for opportunities that we think can be scaled uh, can be you know it's it's a little bit of a string of pearl strategy. Uh, you you stitch it together uh, and then you and you start taking it to all your clients and all your units. Great, great, that's very helpful. But also, if you could just talk about the risk, uh, the momentum that we see. You say that uh, is it uh, stabilizing, and uh, the strategy, the, the the piece that it uh, uh, sort of puts uh, uh, puts in us in our entire piece, and how we want to take uh, digital risk forward from here. Sure. I think we uh, basically said FY18 we'll continue to focus on finding stability in revenues. Uh, we started the year at the lower end of the band. We talked about 28 to 30, but last two quarters we've been at the upper end of the band, which is great. What we've also been able to do is to transform the margin profile fairly dramatically, and uh, and that also has helped us in the overall EBIT picture. And uh, not only that, we've actually also seen, uh, uh, you know, while there was uh, headwinds from volume due to the interest rate situation. We actually uh, identified three uh, strategic areas to find growth and pipeline in. Firstly, uh, you know uh, we sold more of what we do well, uh, so that's clearly a plain, simple take your solution to market. We've got a long-term track record of delivering, uh, you know, uh, services from digital risk. So we've so it's a wallet share game, and, and we've seen some of that convert as well this year. Second, it was getting into near neighbor adjacency, so uh, identifying other domains on the value chain of mortgage, uh, and, and I think that actually has helped as well in finding some revenue momentum in the last two quarters. And thirdly, is integrating our, uh, our, uh, our digital strategy with, the, with using uh, digital risk as our mortgage expert shop, and the city win is a great example of that. So these are the three strategic vectors that we are applying to finding growth in DR. Uh, I think uh, we uh, again early days, but that's that's very much a business in transformation. That uh, hopefully 
uh, we, we'll come out of this uh, stability phase, and, and uh, as we get into FI19, I can talk more about what the outlook is. But at this point in time, I think it's very much a business in transformation and, and very tightly fits in with our inverted T strategy of using them for the depth of mortgage expertise and applying the, the digital transformation capability that we've built at, uh, at the record. Great. Thanks a lot. I'll jump back in the queue. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sumit Jain from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my question and congrats, Nathan, for the good execution. Uh, I wanted to understand, like, I guess you, ga you guys have added a lot of new clients in the emerging industries vertical. So can you comment, like, what kind of clients are there and have you won in the direct channel or the HPDXC channel? Sure, sure. Thanks for that, uh, Sumit. I think a uh, good question. So uh, think of this as a combination of uh, three uh, you know, underlying uh, clients, uh, underlying client segments. Uh, there are certain existing strategic clients in direct core that actually sit in that channel, primarily in travel and logistics, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, in, in, in manufacturing. So we, we've seen good growth. These are part of our strategic list. If, as you know, there are two-thirds of our clients in strategic list are BFSI but the other ones are not. So that is that is good growth coming out of that segment. Second, we've seen also uh, expansion of some of our uh, our deal wins within DXCHP that classify in, into that segment, uh, specifically in areas like travel uh, uh, and, uh, and transportation, uh, as well as uh, uh, healthcare. And thirdly, uh, there is a, uh, there are at least uh, uh, a couple of Blackstone portfolio companies that have also been classified in the emerging segment because that's where they sit. So I think it's, uh, again, fairly broad-based. It's not one client or one deal related. And uh, as we probably get into FI19, we'll try and break it out into uh, two or three other sub-segments and, and maybe uh, you know demystify that a little because it's now starting to become a fairly meaningful percentage of revenue. Yeah, that would be really helpful. And my second question is around the digital projects. I mean, we have been hearing from your bigger peers that uh, they are now becoming bigger in size as the wider integration is happening. And some of the deals are reaching $50 million in size. So are you also seeing that sort of expansion and the scalability of the vendor? Is it an advantage or a disadvantage in, in these digital projects? So, Sumit, uh, I think uh, for those of my peers who are now saying that digital projects are getting bigger, uh, probably earlier said that digital projects were small. I actually never said that they were small. So I think my stance was, always was that digital programs are actually long-term, large programs. You have to get into the ground floor with early engagement, get very closely engaged with the client, both on tech and ops and business, and, and you will actually see long-term uh, you know, large digital program benefits coming to you. And that's exactly what's been happening in the direct core business for the last two or three years. And we haven't seen that uh, that change at all. So I think from a, from that perspective, I think uh, we've been fairly consistent in the way we're executing on, on these projects. And if anything, uh, we are only seeing more acceleration. Uh, from a size perspective, uh, I think uh, we have a we have a great uh, position. We are, we are uh, big enough to, to deliver because we have a long-term track record and we have the ability to, to bring uh, cutting-edge solutions. But at the same time, we are also fairly flexible and nimble in the way we interact with these customers. So I think our size actually is, is playing to our advantage today. Okay, great. And then thanks for that clarity. And maybe one question for Surya, if you can give the clarity around that one-off 40 bits impact on the margin. What exactly is that? Yes. So this was a settlement uh, with a particular client, and that's the one-off uh, we got this quarter. So no impact on revenues of that, per se, in this yes. case? Yes. Okay. okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashish Chopra from Motilal as well Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Happy New Year and uh, congratulations on a good quarter. Uh, Nitin, uh, firstly, just wanted uh, clarification. So uh, there was a drop in revenues in the uh, knowledge process uh, segment. And, uh, you know, we, we used to correlate that to the traction within digital risk. And it seemed to suggest a couple of million dollars of decline in that segment. So if you could just explain uh, as to does digital risk now also get uh, calibrated into maybe some of the other uh, services in the overall mix? So I think, uh, again, uh, Ashish, uh, we have to do a little bit of work to, to potentially uh, align the reporting better with the way the business is actually changing and transforming. So what's happening at DR also is that as we are bringing them closer to ops and tech com combined deals, we started to see some of that revenue, you know, getting merged as ops and tech revenue where we're not doing just the BPA, you know, BPS or 
KPO work, but we're also actually owning the platforms and, and, and using the platform to deliver some of the services, or in some cases, actually even helping clients build their own platforms. So I think it's really a reclassification because, you know, if majority of the revenue went into platform development before we got into business services, that's probably what's contributing to that uh, change. Similarly, if you look at the deal that we signed with the uh, city, uh, it, it's, uh, it's actually a combination of both. Uh, and put, but potentially, because we are now leading it with, uh, with the loan FX front-end solution, we'll probably not classify it as a KPO deal, uh, but it'll actually show up in an AD deal for a period of time till we actually start generating much more processing server revenues from it. Okay, okay, that's helpful. And uh, secondly, just a follow-up on the earlier question around sales realignment. Uh, at, in, at least in terms of your reported headcount uh, over the last two quarters, the SNM count has gone down by almost 13 percent. So, uh, is there also a reclassification there, or uh, just no, wanted not to at all? No, no, I'll explain that. So, I mean, there are two two things to look at it. Uh, go back to what I said. Right? We brought together a lot of the capability and solutioning units and centralized them. That was sitting in the sales expense. When you centralize, you actually generate efficiencies of scale and cross leverage. So that's kind of what's contributing to the headcount decline. But if you look at it, we've also added people where we needed to add people. So the dollar cost on the same period is actually much higher uh, compared to the headcount decline. So I think the focus really is on having the right people in the right roles in the right geographies. Got it. And just lastly, uh, maybe Surya can help uh, with regards to the movement around the margins during the quarter, uh, because I think you added around uh, 400 plus people uh, in the U.S. Uh, at on-site, and then plus uh, there was a wage hike component over there, but still the overall cost uh, seems to be, you know, only a marginal uptick there. So where would we have pulled out the levers? That would be helpful. Yes, so uh, I think uh, we also talked about the one-time impact uh, settlement which also helped us uh, for the EBIT margins in the current quarter. In addition, if you see your fixed price in terms of the percentage, that has also moved up. So as we had uh, mentioned earlier, uh, all the operational levers are also helping us to improve the margins. And uh, naturally the scale in terms of the revenue growth is also helping us. Okay, okay. Thanks so much, guys, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from CIMB India. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and Happy New Year and congrats on a good, good execution. This uh, one question is uh, in terms of a uh, few of our BFSI account clients, uh, uh, some large accounts may be facing some issues because of the hurricane in the U.S. So that may lead to some amount of a uh, like a disruption for you from that account. And second, there are some clients who are also doing the insourcing. So uh, will you able to comment whether you also believe that the insourcing could be a potential headwind in terms of a growth in the BFSI going forward? So I think we did see some impact due to hurricane um, in Q2, but that was more related to disruption of business, not so much related to uh, casualty losses. So far, we haven't really come across any major impacts, so there's nothing to call out on the on the hurricane impact on an ongoing basis. Uh, secondly, on this question of insourcing, uh, contrary to you know uh, common understanding, most of the work that gets insourced is actually run business, and. While you know we do operate run business in, as part of our ADM uh, and IMS practice, I think a lot of the growth that we are seeing is actually coming out of helping them you know either do transformation uh, or more importantly apply you know digital tech and that's why you've seen AD component grow really well for us. So so from that perspective you know we've we've not seen any impact or headwind from insourcing, but you know insourcing or multi-sourcing has been uh, part and parcel of this business for the last 20 years and I think we are. We are very, very comfortable in working jointly with, with clients in that, in that uh, model. Okay, okay. That is helpful. Uh, in terms of digital risk now with the city deal, uh, is it fair to say that uh, the comfort range could be beyond $28, $30 million, what we were foreseeing earlier? I think as we get in closer to FY19, we'll talk about it. Uh, for for FY18, remainder of this year, which means uh, for Q4, we are still holding on to that range. Okay. And last question, uh, the Surya, in terms of the hedging gains, how should we read that? Because your hedge rates have not materially changed, and uh, it still contributes a material portion to the margin. So can we assume that the quantum of hedge gains to the revenue line may continue for the foreseeable future? Yes. I think uh, also the fact that uh, we are following a very well-planned and uh, consistent hedging policy 
that is helping us and uh, if not the same impact as we had in FY18, uh, we'll still see good uh, gains in FY19. Okay. And Surya, in terms of the beat tax in the U.S., uh, are we following a branch model or more a subsidiary model? Uh, if you can just give a color on the same. Yeah, we follow a subsidiary model. But as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of, uh, apart from the just the reduction in the uh, federal tax, there are a lot of other uh, regulations which are part of the announcement. So we are still studying that and will come update uh, once we get the full, uh, do the full impacts uh, study. Okay, and we would be higher than that, uh, the uh, applicable level of $500 million, right? Yes, because actually that's also there is a clarification required because whether it is for applicable for the whole group and uh, there is also another clause with, uh, related, it's not only $500 million, it's also 3%. So all that, uh, I think, uh, still needs to be studied and uh, and then we will let you know. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Madhu Babu from Prabhudas Liladhar. Please go ahead. So one on the on-site ITO headcount that has rise substantially over the last two quarters. So is it any deal specific and what is leading to this increase? I think we talked about uh, this in the last two calls as well. So there were some deals on service transformation that we signed that required uh, higher on-site with transformation capability. So that's what the conversion of that deal is what you're, what you're seeing reflected in the headcount. Uh, but on the same side, on the same uh, on note, you're also seeing uh, because of the transformation and so, uh, managed services stroke fixed price uh, application, you're also seeing the realization of the rates going up. Okay. And second on the fixed price, I think that's starting to trend up uh, regularly on the last two, three quarters. So that is, a, I mean, have we planned this or, you know? How yeah, it's not by accident, it's by design. Yeah. So that should be a margin lever? Absolutely it is, and that's why, you know, one of the reasons why we are seeing a significant uptick in margin this quarter uh, comes from the fact that a number of our, our deals uh, either have been converted uh, or have been newly signed as fixed-price deals, especially uh, in the run business. Okay. And, sir, we are, I've seen that we have increased our hedge position over the last two quarters, I mean, outstanding hedges. So, if assuming the currency would be like at the current rate, so how would the hedge gains would be there for FR19? Any quantification there? I think uh, it will be difficult to quantify uh, because it's also a function of the spot. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, considering uh, uh, we are following, a, uh, you, you also mentioned about the increased uh, hedge positions. So it should uh, help to uh, give, if not as much in terms of absolute numbers with respect to FI18, mm -hmm. but it will be a good uh, uh, quantum in FI19 also. Yeah, I think the other thing to note is, uh, uh, and I think maybe we'll, we'll uh, potentially give some more disclosure on that uh, over the next quarter MDNA. Uh, we've also started to opportunistically see if, uh, if we get an opportunity to go above 80% on the hedge side. So that's probably what you're seeing reflected in the hedge quantum. And uh, given that uh, opportunistically, if we get, an, get a chance, uh, we do have, uh, as per policy, the ability to actually hedge beyond four quarters also, even though that quantum is not uh, significant right now. So that's the reason why you will see, uh, you know, the movement in uh, over our sending hedge, uh, you know, in jump. Okay. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rishi Junjunwala from IIFL. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations on uh, good execution. Uh, Nitin, one question, uh, you know, as a follow-up on that fixed price thing. Clearly, you know, you guys are moving pretty fast on, on you know, fixed price as a percentage of revenues. But we are still way behind where the industry average is. Over a you know long term, where do you th do you think that uh, we can settle around where the industry is, and are there pockets of uh, business where we can't possibly do that, possibly around HP clientele or anything else? Yeah, a great uh, question, Rishi. I think uh, it's not as dependent on the channel where it comes from, but it's more dependent on the type of service it is. Mm -hmm. uh, doing fixed price agile digital project is uh, fairly risky because you know it's the requirements change pretty rapidly and you'll you'll end up getting uh, into situations where either you will have a very unhappy client or you'll have a very unhappy you know CFO so from that perspective we are focused more on applying the lev levers of fixed price and transformation using managed services to the run business run business typically being application management or infrastructure management 
So if you look at the overall mix of our business, about 37, 38% of our revenue is application development. So that's not very easily amenable to fixed price or managed services uh, conversion. So that leaves uh, about 50%, which is AD, AM plus IMS, uh, where we can apply this lever and some, some elements of BPS as well. So I think if you think that as a universe, and if you see uh, off the, you know, let's say off the 60%, uh, we, are, we are now at, uh, from that perspective, we're actually al almost trending closer to where industry needs to be, where industry averages. So uh, we, are, we are not definitely going to go down the road of doing fixed price, fixed uh, development projects. Great. And uh, secondly, on, uh, you know, this quarter specifically, so seasonally it is a weak quarter for us. Clearly some of the HP uh, clients are, uh, you know, see a lot of follows and all. Still we have been able to do pretty solid growth. Um, how much of that would you attribute to, um, you know, better execution based on the deals that we have been winning versus a slightly broader based uh, uptick in demand that you might have seen from the clients? Uh, I think it's uh, probably more the former. Uh, demand, while I think the mood has certainly improved and and uh, there seems to be a general uh, optimism around uh, global macro environment being stable and, and the financial markets being fairly robust, uh, I don't think that has uh, translated rapidly into, you know, budgets going uh, uh, drastically higher. Uh, we'll probably get a better sense of that as as uh, all our clients form up their budgets and also assess the impact of what the tax changes mean for them. So I think we are glad that we were able to minimize the impact of client issues and furloughs in, you know, using, um, you know, some of our, uh, ex you know, deal wins and and, uh, and pressing the accelerator on, on, uh, on all the growth levers we talked about. Uh, I think as we get a better understanding of client budgets, uh, we'll, we'll get a better sense whether they're going to be dramatically different or, uh, or marginally different. Uh, changed. Right. And lastly, on uh, on the DXC bit, um, you know, clearly we are now almost growing at about 20 odd percent year on year. Um, and, and it comes on the back of, you know, several years of deterioration in the business. So clearly, you know, some pent up, uh, uh, you know, revenues coming out there. But more from a sustainable perspective, you've talked about, you know, it growing largely in, in line with where the market growth is. <clears throat> but do you see, uh, you know, upside risk to that in, in the sense that we still have almost 85% of the revenue still coming from just the DXC and the, and the rest of the entities still not, uh, uh, you know, contributing um, in, in, you know, to the overall revenues? So I think uh, if you keep in mind uh, two things. One, I talked about the dramatic shift in the way we manage this uh, uh this channel, you know, we we think of it as uh, multiple accounts within the channel, and even within the XC, there are multiple levers of uh, of expansion and growth. Uh, so, and I talked about that in quite a bit of detail earlier on the call. So, from that perspective, yes, there is runway for growth, there is runway for expansion of wallet share, there is runway to apply our transformation capabilities to every segment of that business. Uh, but uh, I think the issue, the reason we are growing isn't because we didn't grow for six years, so now we had pent up demand. I think the reason we are growing is because we restructured the way we were engaging with them. And and that requires heavy lifting and hard work because, you know, it's a, it, it is a, at the end a, 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 a relationship that uh, that has uh, in transition across multiple corporate entities, uh, you know, from EDS to HP to DXE. So aspirationally, uh, you know, from a modeling perspective, uh, you know, even if we continue to grow this business at market, I think that provides a significant uh, opportunity for us to, uh, to for the company overall to grow, keep growing above market. I think that's the way we are thinking about it, um, uh, you know, from a two to three year plan perspective. Great. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashwin Mehta from Nomura Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity and congrats on good set of numbers. I uh, had one question on your Blackstone portfolio. Uh, do, you, uh, do you believe the Blackstone portfolio business would be accretive in terms of margins, possibly because there is a lesser selling involved here compared to uh, what is there in your direct piece? And secondly, as you start to get into uh, the pre-deal and post-deal initial stages where possibly there is no competitive bidding. So uh, I think it's fair to assume that the margin is fairly in line with the rest of our business for two reasons. Uh, I think 
it's not a good assumption that there is no selling required or, or needed. Uh, you know, while the sales cycle may be shorter, you still have a significant uh, sales effort and, and solutioning effort that goes into it, whether it happens in early stage with or without competitive bidding. Because even without competitive bidding, uh, you have to go through a, a fairly detailed assessment process and, and stand the test of all the financial analysis, uh, given the, the nature of those transactions and, and those deals. So I think uh, as we continue to, 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 uh, to uh, transition them and, and convert them, uh, we'll also have to continue to feed growth and invest in, in them. So I think uh, overall margin at an EBIT level is probably fairly in line with the rest of the direct core business. Okay, fair enough. And secondly, in terms of your selling expenses, it's been kind of constant at, at the $16, $17 million uh, quarterly run rate. Uh, uh, do you think uh, with the expansion plans in Europe uh, uh, and also the plans in terms of targeting the Blackstone clientele, uh, there's a possibility that this will have to go up. I think the overall, uh, I mean, as I talked about it, right, so focus more on the the manpower cost within the selling expense. That line item is something that is directly related to the efforts and the initiatives we're undertaking. That actually has, uh, uh, has, has upticked uh, from a cost perspective, even though from a headcount perspective it is, it is not as high. Uh, as it used to be. And I think it's fair to assume that uh, as we continue to find leverage uh, with grow growth, on a percentage basis, our selling uh, you know, uh, costs will probably be fairly stable because we're okay. going to use growth to feed back for the growth. Okay. Fair enough and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipesh Mehta from SBI Cap Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, and congrats for a very good set of numbers. Just uh, two, three questions from my side. Whether we see the tax reform has any implication on mortgage market, and through which we expect DR any kind of implication because of tax reform. Second question is, what would be the EBIT margin range one should look at, considering the overall growth momentum is now, even in HPDX, is tracking very well for us and uh, fixed price and other things, if I look, most of the variables or uh, operating parameters is now supporting margin. So whether we expect now margin range to track upwards for us than what earlier we used to say about 14 to 16 kind of range. And last thing is about what will be the effective tax rate one should assume, because earlier the guided range, I think for last few quarters, it is tracking much lower than that. It is somewhere around 24, 25 now tracking. So if you can provide some color. So I will answer the first uh, uh, question, and uh, maybe Surya, you can talk about the tax rate uh, separately and talk about the puts and takes. I think uh, while there have been some changes in interest deductibles from a mortgage perspective, so too early to say whether that will have an impact on demand. However, given that I talked about the three strategic vectors of growth in DR, right, uh, selling more of what we do, getting into newer areas that are adjacencies, and applying ops and tech combination like the CDD, I think we are we are focused on creating that uh, you know using those those three strategic levers to to counter any headwind. So uh, at this point in time, I think we'll uh, we, we'll just leave it at that, and, and as things more develop more and and start getting clearer, we'll uh, come back and update you. Uh, so far, nothing to call out in terms of any specific impact. On the issue of uh, overall margin guidance, so for Q4 we'll stay within the we will stay within 14 to 16. Uh, we started this year with the lower end of the band. We are ending the year with, with the upper end of the band. So I think uh, you know we'll, we'll say we'll stay within 14 to 16. As we get into FI19, we'll give you a little more color. But uh, keep in mind the overall strategic two to three year goalpost that we talked about, which was above market growth for the whole company and uh, a gradual improvement in operating margin profile. So that's kind of the goalpost with which we are, we are working. Uh, but how to quantify what the range should be, we'll, we'll give you more color on the FI19 call. And sorry, you can talk about yeah. the tax rate. So, on the tax rate, uh, if you see the last few quarters, it has been in the range of 25 to 27%. And it also depends upon the revenue mix from the various countries uh, where it emanates from. Uh, I think, for the, as I had earlier mentioned in the call, with respect to the t U.S. tax rate impact, we'll come back and update. Uh, for, the current, for the time being, uh, you can assume the same uh, band, 25 to 27% as the effective tax rate going forward. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vishal Desai from Access Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity and congratulations, Nitin, on a good quarter. 
just quickly on the DR bit, I just wanted to understand from a more of a pipeline perspective, given that we have closed the city mortgage deal, uh, would you give some sense in terms of how the pipeline is shaping up out there? Are there any other big logos that we are pursuing or are in advanced stages with? Thanks, Vishal. Uh, I think there's a dif distinction between big logo and big deal. Uh, so given that the transformation deals are typically multi-phase and we are doing them in an iterative fashion, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, we have to continue to, to deliver and get to the next phase of, of each of these transformation deals. I think overall pipeline is, uh, is fairly decent. More work needs to get done to apply the transformation levers that I talked about for DR. Uh, which is which is kind of what uh, FY19 should be you know uh, focused on for for 18. I think if we can stay, uh, we were again at the lower end of the band of 28 to 30. We now you know entered the upper end of the band. If we can stay here uh, at least for the remainder of the year and continue to to uh, build and convert the pipeline, I think we'll be we'll be well set for 19. Sure, appreciate that. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Chen from MK Global. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, firstly, on uh, DXC portfolio, uh, in past uh, we've been articulating that typically Q3 has a some 10% impact from a uh, lower number of working days. Is that impact uh, similar even now? And this growth has come uh, absorbing that impact. And secondly. Uh, as in, uh, we've been highlighting the trend of uh, core transformation that is uh, happening in the banking industry. So, are we trying to uh, play this industry, uh, play this opportunity either through any core investment on enterprise product or maybe on the implementation side of it? Uh, I think on the impact from uh, lower hours, I think we probably have. Uh, absorbed it on a, on a number of fronts. Also, the fact that now the business is, is the mix is moving more towards fixed price also actually minimizes that impact because you don't have to take the furlough impact uh, given that you're outcome-based. So I think we were able to kind of work around those issues. Uh, overall, you know, uh, growth was uh, you know, good enough for us to, to deal with some of the headwinds. On the second question uh, that you had about core transformation, uh, I actually think while core transformation will always be an important lever for clients and and will continue to have opportunity, uh, it's something that a lot of clients have, have been a little frustrated with because it's too uh, complex, high risk, uh, very expensive, and very uncertain in the outcomes, which is where uh, the approach that we talk about, which is a front-to-back approach, actually monetizes your current core and still gives the customer the experience uh, that that the enterprise is trying to trying to deliver, while also giving the enterprise the ability to understand the customer deeper. So I think our uniqueness is, uh, of the solutions actually come from uh, helping enterprises not having to rip and replace the core, but having to actually work with what, whatever core exists, uh, and and taking their own um, you know time and, and efforts to to selectively change the core. It's more about shrinking that core versus really changing the core. Understood. Thank you. That's from my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Parmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Thanks for taking the follow-up. Uh, Nitin, actually, uh, in FI17, uh, if you look at the deal TCV uh, uh, numbers and the tenure, the tenure then, uh, what we used to say was three years. And now we have a much higher uh, deal TCV, wherein uh, we're saying the deal tenure is on an average of two to three. So are we seeing a much higher TCV in totality uh, with a lower tenure. Uh, is that a fair inference to make? And Nathan, I think you're overanalyzing a little bit. And i tell you why Surya was a little guarded in two to three, because yeah. keep in mind the nature of business has shifted. Uh, you know, what used to be a three-year application development deal followed by a three-year application maintenance deal, overall a six-year deal with a fairly chunky revenue, you know, that those kind of deals are non-existent now because even if you actually get a long-term deal, it's transformation-related or, or it will actually have to be done in phases because it's a digital program that will, the first phase will get funded and then the next phase will get funded. So I think from that perspective, uh, the nature of the business itself has undergone uh, a transformation in the way clients are actually buying and the buying behavior and the delivery pattern. So I think for, on that basis, uh, I don't think, you, you know, you should read too much into the two to three uh, versus the three. 
Okay. So every incremental flow of revenue would depend on the success of the first iteration and the second and so on and so forth. Yeah. If you actually sign a, let's say you sign a $100 million TCV deal, but the client's only funded $30 million, we will actually yeah. classify it as $30 million. And it may only be a you know one year or, or a eighteen month engagement versus a hundred million three year engagement. Okay, sure. Fair enough. Uh, thanks, Atal. Thanks. Quite enough. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankit Pandey from Quan Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my follow up. My uh, follow up would be something that I asked uh, last quarter as well. Uh, in our segment classification, we have the information technology, communication, and entertainment uh, segment. Well, that segment is growing uh, very fast last couple of quarters, but its margin is at a different profile now, much lower than uh, the other segments. Uh, other segments are 25 plus, and this one is around 20 or even lower. So could you just highlight what the makeup of this uh, segment, first of all? Again, keep in mind the rapid acceleration that we have seen in our DXCHP channel business, and uh, the obviously the ramp up requires a certain stabilization period to absorb the transition expense and that's what you're seeing structurally i don't think the the margin will be any different okay okay great and uh, could you also share uh, the renewals number uh, in the deal wins if if uh, you can we don't Thank normally you. break that out separately this deal wins is only net new so there is no renewal yeah. in this deal win number absolutely thank you so much thank you so much and all the best thank you Thank you. We'll take a last question from the line of Apurva Prasad from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the follow-up. Uh, if you can just help me with DR revenue for the quarter and uh, the share of direct core in the TCV. I think DR is the, is, is the upper end of the band uh, and uh, uh, you know the 28 to 30 million dollar band that we talked about. In terms of share of direct core in the overall direct international TCV win, I mean it's not very dissimilar to the share of revenue. So Got that's it. a good sum rule to use. Okay. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was the last question. I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Um, thank you guys for your continued interest and uh, and the focus with which you've actually followed through. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again next quarter and uh, have, have a great uh, weekend. Thanks. Thank you. On behalf of Emphasis Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.